G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plugger Podcast. My name is Kane McDonald and I'm joined by my co-host of the show, Connor Rogers. Rog, how are you, mate? Absolutely fantastic. As good as I possibly can be, given we are still, another week has gone by and we have separated by law. Uh, but <laughs> let's hope and pray that uh, this is the final episode we're doing apart and next week we'll be back in business. Absolutely, you'll be here with a stomach full of curry in no time. Um, just a little pat on the back for us, uh, for both of us. I think we've done pretty well, uh, given the circumstances. Absolutely, I couldn't be any prouder of ourselves. Tonight, there was a little uh, blip on the radar, and this is, you know, getting uh, <laughs> access all areas type stuff behind the scenes. This is the stuff... Behind you, the curtain. <laughs> this is the stuff you don't see or hear about behind the show. Uh, McDonald messaged me after the D's Collingwood game, and... Uh, just said, Roggy, we were right to do the podcast uh, shortly. And I said, look, to be honest, mate, I'm a bit rooted. Um, I'm thinking I might just pop a movie on. And Doss, <laughs> being the great leader he is, the the, mo- the man motivator, inspired me to be better. Uh, I stopped mucking about. I put my headphones on, jumped into the studio, and here we are ready to launch into another fantastic edition of Back Pocket Blogger. No, nah, I'm proud of you, Rog. And to be honest, I think the last three or four uh, weeks I've been saying a buy this week, a buy this week, and you've pulled me over the line. So probably speaks volumes about the commitment of both hosts. Absolutely. <laughs> we do love the show, and we're going to bounce straight into it with the headline, Rog. Yes, the headline this week for Dawson Rog Daily is Buckley bows out by beating the best. Ah, it wouldn't be great news for you, Dawson, but as a footy neutral and an absolute footy romantic, um, seeing Nathan Buckley, who's just done so much for the game, watching him beat the top of the table demons in his final game in charge, it hit all the right chords for me, hit me in all the right places. Yeah, it was an amazing performance by the Pies. Uh, You know, I was sort of thinking round seven, round eight, watching the way the Pies were going about it, and I just went... How, how is this? Like The Ds are flying. The Pies aren't flying. This could be the year where we win Queen's birthday and we win it quite solidly. And every year it seems to be a little bit closer than what you'd think, like whether the Ds are on the bottom or the Pies are on the bottom. Um, it seems to be a quite a good contest. But this year I thought, oh, well, geez, the way we're going, this could be the year we really put them to the sword. So I was thinking, you know, 10 goals, 11 goals. On the podcast last week you said – who did the D's have this week? And I was very close to saying, oh, we've got the bye because we've got the pies. And I went to say it and uh-huh. I pulled out. And I, then you went, you, through, out. <laughs> you went through and you said it for me. So <laughs> um, it's, uh, yes, we, we did get beaten um, pretty comprehensively. And it was just impressive by Bucks because uh, he like we were out coached. <laughs> you were absolutely <laughs> out coached. You saw it was like they out Melbourne, Melbourne. Like their defensive setup, and I know Buckley is a man who's prided himself on his defense all through his <laughs> coaching career. But you were yep. just you found it absolutely impossible to penetrate. Our, your our boy the weed unfortunately did not get anywhere near it, and um, yep. it was all thanks to the Pies' unbelievably well coached backline. Do you reckon that makes you know there's any second guessing going on after that? Like, well, maybe Bucks is our man. Oh, well, I was thinking that. I was watching going, geez, they've knocked Adelaide in Adelaide, beaten the D's on Queen's birthday. Geez, they're going okay. Um, it's it's a weird one where they were down and out and they started playing the youth, but it came from like injuries and uh, they had a lot of players to come back. So their start to the season, I think, well, hard to say now, and we don't know, you know, we're halfway through the season, it could get worse or it could get better. But the start to the season, I thought, was a bit tough given the circumstances. Um, and yeah, so they've, they've pulled the trigger on the full rebuild though, which I think you got to do sooner rather than later. Um, I just think they're playing better footy than like a bottom four team, if you get me. Yeah. So all the reports were that <coughs> Buckley was tapped on the shoulder, I think as, uh, might've been Mark Robinson, um, so eloquently put it, um, yep. uh, and told, you know, given his marching orders, you'd have to assume they have someone absolutely finger licking good lined up to take over from him because don't get me wrong we've and we've talked about this on the show before and I do understand that occasionally you do just need a breath of fresh air they're not saying that Bucks isn't yeah. a good coach they're just saying we need a new start we need a refresh we need a new direction um, but at the same time you know you've got a bloke sitting in that chair who's 
won coach of the year before. You know, there aren't too many coaches in mm. the game right now who can put their hand up and say, I was the coach of the year in one single year. So they'd want to make sure they have someone good lined up, but I'm, I'm sure they do. And I, I also have the utmost faith that Buckley will uh, have another home before too long. And part of me is secretly a little sort of hoping that it's my blue baggers. Yeah, he would be an amazing asset for any club to get, whether it's um, as the head honcho role or as like a senior assistant. He's going to get a job somewhere and it, it's going to be quick smart. But I'm someone who wants to hear him in the media. He is so articulate and the way he sees the game and speaks about the game is as good as anyone. So I'd love to see him get a job in the media and just it'd be a pleasure to listen to him commentate every week. Yeah, every, absolutely everyone. Uh especially those in the media have said the same thing, that he will be unreal in the media. And you'll see, um, we'll see another side of him, I think, instead of the mm. stone cold say how it is. I think he will still have that element to him, but we'll get a bit more bit more Bucks personality, which I'm bloody keen to see. Um, but the yeah, flip absolutely. side of the, of you know, is we love watching Buckley, uh, Buckley get the win for his last game. The flip side of that coin is that the D's had their most disappointing loss for the season. I reckon the Adelaide game was sort of, you know, you should have won that game. You didn't play too poorly. Adelaide played well. Collingwood played well today, but I thought you, you played poorly. Yeah, I didn't think we were absolutely horrendous, though, which is still the funny thing. I, I almost think the Adelaide one was a little bit more disappointing because we had won the game with four minutes to go, k- kicked a couple of sealers, and then the Crows uh, from from the grave had, had just risen up and pinched it from us. So I was really frustrated that that was a game I felt like we won with a couple of minutes to go. But this one, from the second quarter onwards, it, it didn't feel like we were going to win at all. Rested our way back into form in the third and then they kept coming late in the third. They might have kicked two late ones in the third to either pinch the lead back, but it was like, oh, no, it's it's not just turning over the way we normally can do it. Um, so it was frustrating, but we were just beaten from word go by a better side. The, the good thing is, I'll go the positive route early. The good thing is, um, for years with the Ds, we will be really consistent against bottom four sides, bottom eight sides, and then we don't beat the top sides. Um, and that that has been a theme for a long time where we, we don't get scalps. For two or three years, we, we haven't pinched a scalp. So to go into this year, we've pinched all the scalps yeah. so far that's come to us. And that's been really, really um, encouraging. But then you start going, well, why aren't we <laughs> beating everyone then? <laughs> like If we're beating the Bulldogs and, and the Lions, why can't we be consistent and beat everyone. But footy's not like that. It's a long, long season. You're going to have your ups, you're going to have your downs. Uh, We've lost a couple of games by a total of three goals. I think we're going okay. It's just that's that's the sort of stuff you want to tidy up going on in the season. And I'm really intrigued to see with the maturity of the group whether we start dropping more games like this or whether from this point onwards it's a real switch on and we become a bit more professional in these sort of games. Well, funnily enough, I think I would rather be in your position where – um, forget about, obviously, everyone would rather be in your position than just about anyone because you have the most wins in the league. But, so, um, you know, just talking from a more superficial standpoint, I would rather be in your shoes where you've had some a couple of disappointing losses, but they've been to teams outside the eight, as opposed to mm. a Port Adelaide um, who have had really disappointing losses against the better teams. Because yep. when you come out to play against the better teams, you know that you would hope if you're a top team yourself – that's like, that's, as you call it, the audit. That's when you're giving 150%. Everyone's hyped up. The, the whole team's yep. there going, right, oh, boys, this is when we show the league that we're contenders and your mentality is there from the word go and the outset of the game. Um, but when you, I can understand that when you play a bottom side, you take your foot off the accelerator just that little bit mm. um, and, you, and you leave the door open for them. So for mine, yep. you know, you've beaten every top eight team you've played so far. And like you said, yeah. Um, you've only lost a couple goal, couple of games and it's by two or three goals total. So um, mm. it's not alarm bells or anything like that. I still think that you're the pre- premiership favourite. Um, and, yeah, I, the commentators are saying during the game, you know, is this cause for uh, cause for alarm with the Ds? I don't believe it is at all. Um, but one disappointing aspect, um, I would say, is that uh, I would have expected 
maybe a bit more considering it was the big freeze. Uh, Neil Danaher, obviously a great days man. You would have thought that that would have uh, pumped them up to play a more inspiring brand of footy, would you not? Yeah, no, you would. Um, yeah, very disappointing that we couldn't get it done, especially on such a big day for the club and a big day for uh, oh, for the game. So, yeah, it was a little bit disappointing. I was even sort of looking, like we're down by three goals. There's seven or eight minutes left and I'm looking around at, at, uh, at Gorney in particular and I'm looking around for like a bit of a spark from the leaders. Like I just felt like, yeah, they were sort of stuck in gear three all day and never moved like – Against the Lions, gear three till half time, went up to five in that third quarter and then controlled the game sort of in gear four for the rest of the game. But it was just, there was no shifting of gears and it was just a little bit frustrating. I thought, you know, you don't want to throw all the, ba- uh, th- you know, throw throw all the ideas out of the basket and get rolled by five or six goals. But there was a, a point with about 10 minutes to go where it's like, I think we start taking it on more, try and change something up. Um, and we weren't able to do it to Collingwood's credit. So, yeah, it was disappointing. Yeah, for, for you know, around like that, a game so important to us, it was, um, yeah, pretty frustrating. But speaking of the, the round that it was, obviously being freeze MND, uh, be remiss of us not to quickly, you know, every, everything that's been said about him has already been said and will continue to be said. But, J Neil Danaher, uh, once again, just puts on an absolute clinic. Um, I don't know if there's anything you could possibly add to what's already been said, but uh, worth noting that he's just an absolute champion and an inspiration to everyone, wouldn't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Perfectly said. And it's just like it's crazy. Um, If I was diagnosed with something, um, like a a terminal illness, I think one of the last things that I would think of is spending the rest of my days um, finding a cure so no one else gets given uh, that terrible news that, you're going to die from this disease. Like I think to stand up and go, I'm going to be the one so people in the future don't have to, you know, cop the, the conversation that I had from the doctors. I think it's just so inspiring and it's, 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 it's just him doing it pretty much. Like there's obviously he's got a big team around him and the fight for MND guys do an amazing job, but it's come off the back of this one person and it is very inspirational Um, and it's just such a selfless way to live out the rest of your days. I couldn't agree with you anymore. Like, you know, touch wood, I think if it was one of my best mates, if you happen to get a terminal illness and you pass, then I could imagine there is a world where I would take big steps to, you know, raise money for that charity or raise awareness or something Mm. like that. But if it happened to me myself, if I was the one who got the, the illness or the disease, I can't imagine that... You know, I would. Uh, that would be my future as well. That I'd be dedicating my whole life to this to this cause. So I'm with you yeah. there. Um, he got the Order of Australia, which uh, isn't Australian of the Year, but it is recognition um, for uh, unbelievable work and service to your country. Mm. Um, so that was glad to see. But he's hoping, and I know, uh, you know ever absolutely everyone says this, and it's a pretty um, predictable and generic thing to say. But let's pray that he does get the Australian of the Year. Um, you can yeah. his speech is starting to really slur and deteriorate. So you'd love for it to be a crowning achievement, uh, but and it's not a uh, what's the word posthumous or something like that. Not something that happens yeah. after he happens to pass. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, amazing work by Neil, and it's uh, yeah, very inspirational. Uh, just quickly, where where do you, moving on? Where do you see the cats sitting at the moment at the halfway point of the competition? Well, um, early, I'll, yeah. I've said it a couple of times. Earlier in the season, I did write them off. Um, I thought they were a bit too slow. They hadn't adapted to the new game style. But, uh, Jay, uh, after watching Jeremy Cameron and Tom Hawkins run a mark and you've got your, your Gary Rowan and Luke Dalhouse, Dalhouse types uh, running around there as well, it's hard to knock them and it's hard to see too many faults with them. I just – I can't – I can't tip – against a side that has Cameron mm. and Hawkins running around their forward line with a player the caliber of danger and Salwood and these types in the midfield as well and you know great back line as well I think um uh, so yeah it's uh it's, it's a struggle to see a hole in them and look I still have demons as my number one I've put I've Gordon all in on the days. Um, I still think they're the best time in, team in the competition, but Cats are a very, very, very close number two. And if anyone told me they have them number one on the power rankings, I wouldn't argue with them either. No, I wouldn't argue with them either. Especially they've uh, they got the runs on the board, so it's it's a if, if the Cats had 
you know, were 11 and 1 or uh, 11 and 2 now, I think they'd be everyone's clear flag favourite. And it's the only reason the D's aren't absolute, like, certainty flag favourites is because they're still an unknown. Like, we have never seen the D's uh, in this position before. We've never seen whether they fall off in the back end of a season. We've never seen whether they choke and go out in straight sets. But with the Geelong and the Tigers, you know what you're getting from this point onwards. And it, it's a weird one because... They should have been 0-4. Yeah. <laughs> um, they pinched a game. And it's, it, it's, it's a testament to them that they just find a way to win. Like other teams in their situation would be 0-4 comfortably, but the Cats found a way to win against the Lions, found a way to win against the Hawks. Um, a little bit sluggish against the Saints. Probably shouldn't have won that game because the Saints had shot after shot <laughs> and couldn't buy a goal 15 out. So it, they have seasons where there's sliding door games, but because of the culture, because of the way they play, they get like the more wins in those 50-50 games and losses. And when they bank wins, they get the momentum and then they're always there about. So I think they're a side that have, I think they're building probably as well as any other team. And yeah. I'm starting to worry about the Tigers in particular. They're not building like a Geelong. I, I still think the Tigers will be in the top eight, but it's not a it's not a premiership building type year at the moment. They're not building they're definitely not building. It's not uh like they're getting incrementally better each week and we can go, oh mm. yeah, wait another eight weeks and they'll be prime for finals. I think everyone's just hoping that when it comes to September they can just flick that switch and go uh not not in the form of Rick Matheson, but just go base mode. Um, yeah, in that yeah. period of time, so it wouldn't surprise me if they did. To be honest, if we, if we, if I walked in, uh, if you gave me a crystal ball into finals <laughs> and I saw Dustin Martin going absolutely bananas and they won another <laughs> premiership, it wouldn't shock me. I'd, it, it'd go, yep, yeah, they've done it before three, uh, three times <laughs> and they've done it again. So, yeah, uh, nah, the cats, they're there or they're about for sure. Uh, just did you see uh, or catch the Mackay bump for uh, McKay bump for Adelaide? Yeah, I did. I did see it. What do you think of that one? Uh, for mine, footy act. Um, shocking, shocking, shocking result. Uh, Hunter Clark has cracks in his jaw, left, right, and centre. Um, like a, as uh, as textbook a broken jaw as you can see. Um, <laughs> In terms of like, like Tyson, I stuff. think, yeah. Well, I think when you break your jaw, you get two breaks in it, um, and I think the second break comes, so there's less damage in a way. Like, I think your body breaks; it breaks in two places. I think I'm absolutely talking out my ass here, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the case. So that's why I went like textbook uh, broken jaw because I think it was cracked in two places. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, shocking, shocking result, um, and shocking byproduct. But I don't think it was sniper-ish laid him out for no reason I think it was a bloke just trying to get to the footy first and sort of coming in I don't think he came in late I think he came in sort of at the same time 100% I couldn't Um, agree anymore I think it's impossible to predict what the opposing player is going to do so when he saw that the ball was in between him and the uh, who was the player he hit Hunter Clark Hunter Clark the ball was between him and Hunter Clark and he knew that if he runs at full pace towards that ball, there is a reasonable chance that he'll take possession of it. The only way yeah. he won't take possession of it is if Hunter Clark uh, beats him to the ball. And if Hunter Clark does beat him to the ball, it'll be by millimetres. It'll be by an eighth of a second. So yeah. you can't sit there and go and in that in in real time calculate, you know what, he probably will beat me by an eighth of a second so I won't run 100% in. You have to yeah. give yourself the best chance of winning that football. That's what football is. That's the whole premise of the game. So yeah. um, he runs 100% in, flat out, as you are instructed to do from juniors till the day you give the give the game up. And uh, Hunter Clark does get there, but just, like, it, it wasn't late. It was they both. Mm. It was like they both met at the same time, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was just desperately unlucky. So if you were to suspend <laughs> him for that, I feel like what you're telling people is don't run 100% at the ball. Uh, sort of go half pace so then you have time to calculate what's going to happen or whether there's a chance you injure someone. Absolutely yep. ridiculous for mine. Um, 
I felt the same about the Plowman hit. I thought that shouldn't be a suspension, and I feel like this uh, is probably less deserving of, sus- of the of a suspension than the Plowman one as well. So I'll be very, very, very disappointed if he gets weeks for that. What did the tribunal give it? I think it no, just so sort of the, happened. The oh, what? Literally in the last five minutes? No, no, no. In the last like hour. Well, I haven't heard of the tribunal's decision. I know the MRO uh, re- uh, referred it straight to the tribunal, and initially and th- he refused yeah. to grade it because it. I don't. I think he thinks he should get. There was nothing to see, and then yeah. um, the AFL stepped in and went, "No, no, no. We've got a bloke who's got a broken jaw as a result of a quote unquote bump." Um. Uh, yeah. So this needs to go to the tribunal. But surely Mackay's defence can be at the tribunal. Hang on, your match review officer themselves. Forget about what I think. <laughs> your match review officer gave it the all clear. So how could it possibly be a suspension? Especially what they're talking... It's not like one where it's like, oh, you know what? You were a fraction late, so we'll give you one week. Um, it, mm. If he's guilty, it's severe contact, it's... Um, or uh, high, and he's gone for three or four weeks. So it's not just like, oh, he made a small mistake by getting there a fraction late. It's he's out for four weeks, and there's no way that should be four weeks. No way, or no. three. No. No, I'm with you. Yeah, it wasn't like fraction late. Um, Hunter Clark's got the ball and just starting to look up and gets cleaned up. It was like at, at the same time, they've both collided. Um, and... It, it's still. I know it was a bump, but it wasn't really a bump. He just ran into him. Exactly. It wasn't like it was he, a collision, he braced, right? it was turned. A yeah, it was just a, a footy collision. So seriously unlucky for Hunter Clark, and um, yeah, I hope McKay doesn't doesn't get weeks because I think that'd be not the right result. Speaking of uh, protecting the head, and this is one that we didn't have in our little run sheet that our producer gave us. So this is uh, this is a question without warning. Uh, mm. What did you make of the Hawthorne knockout? Uh, the boxing, the dust up. Not a dust up. Um, <laughs> then the no headgear boxing that resulted in a concussion. Well, it worked in terms of apparently Clark. I wanted to toughen up, toughen them up a little bit, so they did sort of um, contested physical drills and um, did some boxing as well. Um, not a great result when a teammate's knocking out another teammate. Who was it again? Uh, was it Mitch Lewis? Uh, Mitch Lewis got yeah knocked out. Yeah, so for those that may not may not have heard the story, uh, Mitch Lew- the Hawks boys, uh, Clarko got them all to box to toughen them up a little bit, and Mitch Lewis copped one to the head. Uh, they weren't wearing headgear, and he got knocked out. So, bit of a tough one. And the AFL has asked for a please explain. Carry on, McDonald. Yeah, so he's got to now do the two week uh, concussion protocol and. Uh, so he's out for the next couple of rounds because of a little bit of sparring in a training session. I don't know, like I don't know whether it was like um, like body only sort of sparring where you you leave the head out and it's just body shots or what has happened there. Uh, and it might have been a, a, a slip and a bit of a mistake, but really, really not like not good preparation losing a player. Um, uh, well, like I, th- I think there's a time and place for that sort of stuff, maybe on a preseason camp. But I think during the week, it's it's too high risk. Yeah, it's a. If we're speaking from a player welfare perspective, now I love boxing. Like I am a massive boxing fan. I love when we do boxing down at the local footy club. I think it's as good as it gets, really. Mm. Uh, but from the sounds of it, and obviously we weren't we weren't there, and the the police explain hasn't been answered yet, so we don't know the details. <laughs> but it sounds like Clark goes, you know, really instructed them to have a go at each other, um, really dig in and show us what you got. And they weren't wearing a headgear, and you know, if you're a player, you're not able to say, Clarko, I'm not going to participate in the boxing. Um, I feel uncomfortable by it, or whatever it may be. You just got to do yeah. it, um, and. Uh, we, as much as we love footy and we know that it's a sport and it's so different to any other workplace for an abundance of reasons, uh, I don't know if you can ask your players to box. And these blokes are fit, big, <laughs> six foot, strapping, muscly blokes. You can't. I don't know if you can ask them to box against each other without wearing headgear uh, uh, and expect it to be. All okay. I think, uh, you know, so at the end of the day, if someone's got concussed in the workplace for something that isn't really part of their you know, job description, their, their job yeah. is to play football, not box without headgear on. You know, even the yeah. amateur boxers put headgear on when they box. Um, so, uh, yeah, it is a tough one. And I can understand why the AFL has asked for a please explain. And I do know that people will be sitting there going, fuck's sake, they're just, they're just training for a yeah. game and they're having a, bit of a, they're having a bit of a box to toughen up. 
I 100% yep. get that point of view as well. I really do. Um, but, yeah, I, I do understand the AFL's point of view where they go, we can't have players getting concussed uh, for no for no reason. Yeah, perfectly put, Rog. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the Hawks get Mitchie Lewis back because he's a very, very exciting tall target. Um, Rogie, Sunday night football was unbelievable on the weekend. Uh, the game kicked off at 6.40, 7 o'clock, so it wasn't like full-on 7.50 game where it goes too late. Um, sort of kicked off at a reasonable time. Might have been seven. To, might have been seven forty. Actually, maybe I got that wrong. But Sunday night football was amazing on the weekend. Uh, the Tigers, I thought, got the Chockeys done against the West Coast Eagles. But in comes one of the best key forwards of the last fifteen years in Josh Kennedy, and he's pulled off one of the uh, one of the great upsets. And our West Coast back. Uh, they're definitely not back. Um, <laughs> they are the flat track bullies of the millennium. So uh, yes. if they d- if they did it at the MCG against the Tigers, then I'd be there. Uh, I'd be waving their flag higher than anyone. But um, yep. don't get me wrong. I'm not taking anything away from the win. It was sensational. I was actually at great mate Tommy Broxham's house. He's uh, he's from England, and uh, we were going to watch the the Euros at 10 p.m. So uh, mm-hmm. we're over there, we're having a few drinks, and the game was a bit boring. I don't know if you thought the same, but I thought the first half of the game was a little bit average on the ice. So we went outside on the balcony, um, had a few out there and, and talked some absolute tripe, and then we come back in and it turned into one of the great games of the year. And uh, Josh Kennedy, who, in my personal opinion, played his better f- football at Carlton. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a general consensus. Yep. Uh, everyone says Judd played his best footy at West Coast, but everyone forgets about the 20 games Josh Kennedy played at Carlton. <laughs> Very average, half a goal a game. Uh, uh, yeah, p- put it through the big sticks. And he, uh, do you, part of me weirdly feels as though he's slightly underrated by the footy community, especially in Victoria. Like, I know everyone knows mm. he's great. But um, when we talk about the best footballers we've ever seen or, you know, that people our age, when we talk about the great footballers in the game, everyone's quick to go, oh, Buddy, Martin, Ablett, Judd, these sorts of players. And I don't – I think people put Josh Kennedy in that next bracket. People aren't so quick to name Josh Kennedy, but I think he needs to be right up there, especially as far as power forwards go. I don't know if you'll find too many better. Mm. Would you agree yeah, that he's well, a little bit underrated? Well, I, I think slightly underrated. He's not forgotten in terms of like who's a good key forward and he doesn't get named. He's definitely in the top two or three that gets named straight away in that sort of trivia type quiz. Um, so I think he's like slightly underrated, but geez, he is a very good footballer. Uh, just to, you know, uh, take a little bit away from the West Coast amazing win, that Liam Ryan kick went four metres. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, it did. <laughs> and, Debatably hit the grass before it got to Kennedy, but um, regardless, it was a, a great victory. But oh, they're sort of oh, that's sorry to cut you off, Toss. No, you're right. <laughs> that's uh, one aspect of the game. I don't know how they can do it, but surely in a, in a generation where we have everything at the touch of a button on our phone, we have we are so over resourced. It's not funny. Put man on the moon. Surely there is a way we can accurately determine if the ball's travelled 15 metres. Because at the moment, it is an absolute lottery and (laughs) it's a shambles. I I think in one of the things that I would like to see is potentially it get changed from 15 metres to 20 metres. Because 15 metres... It's a short kick, and it and your mind, your eyes can play play tricks on you. Where the ball's yeah. gone twelve meters, but um, and it's and you just go, oh, it's uh, it can look like fifteen. I think if you stretch mm. it out to twenty, there's no there's less gray area because with the twenty meter kick, it has to be a decent kick. There's no short, ki- you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, you look, you see a decent length kick, and you go, that's a mark. Whereas at the moment, it can be a pissy little kick, and you go, oh, that might have scraped fifteen. We'll pay that a mark. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it is very frustrating because in the same game, and I don't blame the umpires, it's very hard to determine how far 15 metres is when you've got a million things going on around you and it's happening live in action. But, uh, yeah, you'll see someone kick out the square five metres to a pocket who's standing just outside the behind post. They pay it a mark. Then that bloke kicks it another 15 metres up the line (laughs) and they call play on. And it's like, well, the same length kick, mate. So, yeah, anyway, sorry, I did cut you off for that little rant there. No, you're right. I was just going to say that uh, the West Coast Eagles, they are in that Port Adelaide bracket for mine where they, they, them at home are as lethal as anyone else. Like they are just, they are a top four side 
playing at Optus Stadium. And I know that the West Coast fans do get a little bit annoyed by the commentary around uh, not being able to play well in Victoria, for instance. Um, I think I saw, you know, some people <laughs> commenting on your Twitters and whatnot saying, can't play in Victoria. How about that win against Hawthorne? And I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not sure whether that you can claim that one. But um, the, just quietly, yeah, they, they, just, this is they, a one-sentence one. The Hawks played yep. unbelievable that game. They played such good footy uh, oh, yeah. So uh, this week. I was so impressed with them. Uh, but we'll carry on. Uh, with the um, with no, they were. They were very good. But, yeah, yeah West Coast, are in, in the overall scheme of things, they're in the Port Adelaide bracket for mine where it's like, I feel like they're better than what they're performing. I feel like their best, best, best is good enough, but I don't have the trust that they can do that. Well, for mine, um, I think they're slightly different because for West Coast, I see them as flat track bullies, plain and simple. They just play at home and they, they cannot play away. Um, it's like they lack every bit of courage when they jump on that plane. They get off the plane and their ball, their testicles have been drained of every, of every bit of testosterone they possibly have. Uh, yes, yes. So that's the boat I put West Coast in. Whereas Port Adelaide, I see them as just pretenders. They're not necessarily flat track bullies. <laughs> I just don't think they're good enough for the very best teams. They're a good side and they beat yeah. they beat all the bottom sides and they beat the middle rung teams. But against the very, very best, the upper echelon, they crumble. So it's not really a home or an away or a mentality thing. I think they're just quite simply not good enough for the very best teams. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think you've actually nailed that pretty well, to be fair. <laughs> Thank you. I try my hardest. Uh, but speaking of uh, absolutely ripping game-winning goals, uh, I'm going to butcher his name. Can you say his name for he, for me? The lad from Adelaide who kicked one over his head to get the sausage roll? Well, I thought it was Till, as in like Tillthorpe, but I think it's Thilthorpe. So the double TH, which uh, might be a bit tough for you. <laughs> Thilthorpe, yeah, for a man with a Thilthorpe. Lift. For a man with a lisp to get asked to pronounce the double TH, the Thilthorpe. Yeah, Riley Thilthorpe. <laughs> uh, I, I would actually like it if there were more Thilthorpes in the world because it, then it would make it seem like there's more people in the world with a lisp and uh, yeah. I'd, I'd get away with mine. Uh, but yeah, uh, the Crows, <laughs> I I am loving the Crows this year. Like I, went, I am too. I went into it this season that pessimistic about the Crows. You hear Kane Corns jump on the blower and say, this is the worst Adelaide side that will ever take the field. And you start to believe him. Um, but they've come out and it's been said a million times for what Tex Walker keeps on doing. Um, and it's not just his on-field uh, performance. It's the way he lifts the team. Like I feel like the team's on his shoulders mm. and they uh, are with him on the journey. And to see this young lad who could catapult into rising start calculations, as I'm hearing... Um, uh, kicked that goal over his head after missing a shot just previous to that. It, it was absolutely brilliant to see, and I love what Adelaide are doing. Riley Philthorpe, I absolutely love him. Um, it was a bit of a tough one in the draft. They went the SA boy uh, just to guarantee some no home, you know, no home factor, go home factor. Some no go home factor yeah. uh, is what I was trying to say. So they, they picked him over Logan McDonald because – it was sort of touch and go between who was the better key forward. Logan McDonald probably was the better key forward, but you weren't missing out on heaps getting Riley Thilthorpe. Um, he didn't play the first couple of games. I think he debuted against the Hawks, kicked five in his first game, and he is just so exciting. And you just you just hope for, for the Crows' sake that the big fog really gets to that level we all thought he could. Um, he's been pretty consistent this year and starting to put together a bit of a better performance. But if him... And uh, if, if the Fog and Thilthorpe really get going, that is a, a nice little uh, combination up front. Weapon of a forward line. Is Himmelberg still down there? Is he still running around doing a thing? Oh, <laughs> Elliot Himmelberg? He, yeah, well, he's punching blokes at training still, I think. Yeah. No, I think I think he is still there. Well, he could add something to it. And, yeah, they have got a tight... <laughs> <laughs> they have got a very tight, tidy-looking uh, group of youth there. I'm stoked mm. for him. Stoked for uh, the coach as well. Um, he was... Matty... Uh, uh, Matty Nix. Matty Nix. He was under fire. Um, Hellfire and Brimstone, and he's managed to pull himself out. And he just seems like a ripping bloke as well, which we love to see. Yeah. But once yeah. again, um, the flip side of this coin. And I've apolo- the last few weeks, I've apologised to the St Kilda fans before I berate them. Uh, but I'm not going to apologise this time. Uh, oh, <laughs> that's fair. Because the club, uh, excuse the expletive, <laughs> the club is absolutely fucked. 
They, <laughs> they are just like, and I know I, I acknowledge that Carlton is nowhere. So this isn't. I'm not saying they're any better than Carlton, but <laughs> they are just abso- oh, no. absolutely insipid. And I'm not blaming the coach. I'm not blaming the players per se. It's the whole club from top to bottom. They, if oh. anyone needs a review, it's them. And I feel so sorry for their loyal supporters, um, especially the older ones who have seen. Only one flag in over 150 years. But, uh, mm. uh, yeah, it, to me it seems like even if they had the best list in the competition and they had the best coach in the competition, Sutton tells me they still would not win that big dance. I wouldn't get, I'd give them Buckley's chance of winning that big dance. It is so frustrating to watch because I've been there before and to see them bob up for one final series in 10 years and then just fall off the face of the earth without any real, uh, any real, uh, you know, uh, evidence to show that this is an, uh, like a, a bit of a anomaly sort of year. Like I think the day shot up. It's hard to be an anomaly when it's happened for a hundred and bloody 70 years. <laughs> <laughs> like a recent instance that I can think of is like the day's shooting up, um, making a prelim, then dropping off. But they dropped off through some circumstances. But you could see that core list of, like, really promising talent. Um, and even, like, the Bulldogs, they pinched a flag and then dropped off for a couple of years. Didn't quite go down as far as the Ds or the, the Saints, but they dropped off for a couple of years. But it's still this really core, talented list where you're going, geez, their top seven or eight players are as good as any. So you just give them time, um, which is the case for the Ds and the Bulldogs. Not that the Ds have achieved anything, or the Bulldogs necessarily, but they've come back with that core list and now they're playing good footy. You look at the Saints last year and they won and it just looked like, and this, you know, Roger's probably the the bad cop in this and I'm probably the good cop and this is probably as hard as I'm going to go on them because I don't don't really want to pot them. But as a team who won a final last year, they looked like a bunch of recycled sort of B-grade footballers, I thought. Like, even with the way that they were playing, I wasn't full-blown convinced that this Saints team was something to really get excited about. Yep. And even, like, they were lauded for their money ball type trading um, last year. And I was still looking going, and you know, I was still looking going, geez, you're Zach Jones and, um, well, even, like, you're Brad Crouch and a lot of these players that are coming in are not... I don't know, then they hadn't quite convinced me just yet. Um, and yeah, it's sort of, you're looking at them now going, it's not a young list that needs time to develop. It's not a, it's not a, um, you know, exciting list that have heap, heaps of injuries, but when they come back, it'll click. It's really worrying st- uh, times for the Saners. It is. Just quickly, that has been a little uh, gripe of mine, uh, is people have used the term money ball to describe uh, St Kilda, the last, as you said, the last year or two. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And the people that are using that clearly don't know what money ball is because money ball, <laughs> the baseball team, and I'm sounding like I'm sounding a bit like an old fart at the moment, the amount I'm complaining, but uh, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, Carl, maybe Carlton's 20 years of disappointments finally starting to get to me and ruin my happiness. <laughs> but uh, yeah, with the money ball, uh, the baseball, just quickly, the baseball team that didn't, and a couple of soccer teams have done it since, they base mm. it purely on stats. They go, the baseball team went right. Even though no one wants this player because he doesn't know how to throw, he doesn't know how to catch, he gets it to first base 80% of the time. So we'll get him and we won't make him catch. We won't make him throw. We'll just make him get to first base and we'll let other people take care of the rest. Genius. Yep. Unbelievable. So good. Uh, that's not what St Kilda are doing. St Kilda aren't looking at the. It's not a yeah. mathematical st- statistic thing where they go right. We're going to plug holes, uh, get people in here that's good at this, and then it'll m- come together to make the perfect team. They're there mm. going. Oh, you don't want Hanabry anymore. I oh, will take Hanabry. <laughs> He's. You don't want him because <laughs> yeah. he can't get on the park. We'll take him. You don't want. You, yeah. don't, you don't want that bloke. Oh, we'll take him. It was like they. Yeah. It doesn't seem like there's much rhyme or reason behind it. I mean, there probably is some rhyme or reason, but yeah, I don't think it's quite money ball. Uh, should we move on to the G's, the B's, and the O's? Yes, absolutely. All right, without further ado, it's time for everyone's favourite segment: the G's, the B's, and the O's. I'll kick us off with our out on the fools McDonald. 
And yep. we were talking about the insipid uh, St Kilda Football Club, uh, and uh, these have, these guys have been my out in the fall a couple of times before uh, for the Back Pocket Blacker podcast, and it's a Gold Coast Football Club. They mm. were actually the bookies' favourites going into this game. Uh, their opposition had just a multitude of outs. This was their chance to get another win on the board, um, and they just couldn't do it. And they didn't look anything like it. They it was one of the worst games of football you've ever seen, and um, you know. When is this club going to show some culture? Going to show a bit of fight? I don't. I don't see it happening anytime soon. They've got the talent there. They've got a ripper coach. When when are they going to piece it together? I have no idea. But they're they're just as hopeless as St Kilda. Yeah, well, they got to get it going soon because their sort of new crop are now two or three seasons in, three or four seasons in, and it starts to um, the the sort of culture starts to reinvent itself again if they don't sort of turn it in the next well in the next year really so yeah another disappointing performance but hopefully they can bounce back and i hope uh, so i would love to see gold coast storm up the ladder and the new kids on the block this new team they get a bit of fanfare up the gold coast and it's like yes this is what we've been waiting so long to say i would love it i'm just struggling to say but i hope they do for stewie duke because he deserves it yeah for sure um i'm going to move on to my out on the full uh we love characters in the game we love hard characters in the game. We do. Everyone's favourite players are you know, some of the hardest, uh, scariest, brutalist men in the game. And someone that we've loved for a long time in Shane Mumford, mm. I think is just going way over the line and has been for two or three seasons now in the way he conducts himself. And the commentary around it, uh, and I've seen some people talk about this recently, but the commentators encourage it. They go, ha ha, look at, look at funny Mumford. Look at him just do some, you know, funny stuff on the field. But what I'm seeing is some pretty scumbag stuff, some pretty dirty, um, some pretty dirty tackles, some knees in the back of guys' heads when they're on the ground. When he drops them, he drives his elbows in. I'm seeing him just do some really bang average, non-football sort of actions on the field. And on the weekend, he's nearly killed Taron Thomas. He nearly kills anyone he goes near and... I think his attitude is like, I actually don't care if I get a week because I need a week off. I can't play all season. So to get a couple of weeks off is fine by me. I'm in and out of the side anyway. But I, I'm just not a fan of it. And I think he's got to start, you know, free kicks and suspensions need to start happening soon because I think he's just a thug. He's gotten away with far too much for far too long. <laughs> I, it was just, his, like you said, it was just, it, it became a trope of our game. It was just, oh, here he is, the big clumsy Mumford, the mummify. He's, yeah. He's, yeah. And I don't know why he gets, like, if it was a... T- I feel like if it was a Toby Green or someone else doing the stuff he was doing, it would have been weeks yeah. already. So just because yeah. he's a massive lump of a lad and he's big and thick and looks a bit dumb, I don't know why he could... <laughs> I'm not saying he's dumb, but he looks a bit clumsy. I don't I know, know what you're saying. Yeah, I don't know why he uh, why he gets away with it, but I couldn't agree more. My behind, and this is one that I'm a bit passionate about, I have been before, uh, is uh, Adam Goods rejected the um, Hall of Fame offer from the AFL. And um, mm-hmm. without getting into the whole saga, it was, you know, it was the most shameful moment in our game, I, I would have thought. Uh, yep. But, uh, yeah, him I – gi- I give this a behind because it, make, it makes me legitimately sad that this is one of the all-time greats of our game, um, a two-time Brownlow medalist, premiership player, most games of uh, an Indigenous footballer, I think, or he's in the top two or three. Um, yep. As big a champion as he gets who declines a Hall of Fame offer, and it was Jared Waitley put it so uh, eloquently um, when he said something along the lines of, the reason why he's declined it, if you're there calling him in a sook or an attention seeker for declining it, uh, the reason why he's declined it is exactly because of the response this has gotten. He's declined yep. the offer and everyone's jumped on going, oh, you're a sook, Adam Goods, you're this and that. So clearly, as a whole, the footy community hasn't learned. They still don't understand. Um, so it's a behind because I, I so wish that he was in there, but I completely understand his decision to reject it. And if you're still, um, I don't mean you, I mean the footy public is still unconvinced, I highly recommend watching the documentary that Adam Goods had nothing to do with. It just happened to get made about him because um, that'll basically show you everything you need to see. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like I remember Sam Newman would go on the footy show and say, Adam Goods doesn't get booed because he's Indigenous. He gets booed because he's a bit of a dodgy player. 
I never thought that Adam Goods was a snipe and sook and I, I never thought he would be in the boo category. I thought he was just a good hard footballer. Well, so I, I, I mean, I could get into it all day. I won't, <laughs> but just a couple of, if I was to say just a couple of little points, uh, one of the main arguments was, <laughs> oh, that we boo, we don't boo Eddie Betts, but we do, uh, but we boo Adam Goods, so we're not racist because we don't boo Eddie Betts. Eddie yep. Betts isn't the face of racism. Adam Goods came out and he said Australia is still has still has racism in it. We need to fix it. Um, so there's a big difference between him and just another Indigenous player, and mm. uh, and people say we boo him because he's a, a, a dodgy player or whatever. Um, well, you look at the amount he got booed. It was hun- it was every single week, every single time he touched the ball by an entire stadium. And there have been so yep. many more dirtier players than him, like a Shane Mumford or let's say a Toby Green, whoever you True. want to say. So people use yep. the argument, oh, we don't boo Eddie Best, but we do boo Adam Goods. Well, hang on. On the count of, on the flip side, why do you boo Adam Goods, but you don't boo Shane Mumford every single time he touches the ball yep. with, with the whole stadiums every single time you play? So that's all I'll say for now. But yeah, behind Adam Goods. That you've been, no, that's been perfectly said. Um, yeah, once again, really hope that we're uh, that the, that Adam Goods isn't lost to the game, even though it seems like he is at the moment. Hopefully, years can sort of heal his wounds because, yeah, one of the greatest players to ever play the game. Um, it's really disappointing to, that he doesn't want a bar of the uh, of the competition. To be honest, a big part of me hopes he doesn't come back to the game because I think even if ten years down the track he goes, of the heels have wounded. I feel like people understand. I accept the Hall of Fame induction or whatever it may be. I feel like all the the ignoramuses that still haven't learned will come out again and uh, remind us of exactly why you should stay out of the game. But hopefully they prove me wrong. Mm, really messy, messy situation. Uh, my behind this week. Now, it's one of my boys. I'm going one of my boys. Oh, um, here we go. Uh, f- friend of the show. I Well, yeah, I'd say friend of the show. Sammy Wiedemann is in me behinds at the moment just because it's a debate that we've been talking about for a little bit um, uh, with the Ds because we are spoilt for choice. Um, we're spoiled for choice in the key forward stocks, which is a really exciting uh, position for the Ds to be in. I just think Sammy Weed he's, does a lot of stuff right in the way he plays. Um, he crashes packs, usually, uh, really competitively. He gets other players involved. And I remember you know, against the Bulldogs a couple of weeks ago, three or four times he dropped marks that he probably should have taken, uh, but it fell down to Aspargo, James Jordan, Cosy Pickett. And they were the beneficiary of his work. So I find him really important to our team from that aspect. But I think he's just been... The output in the last couple of weeks since he's come in has been a little bit low on the scoring and the marking uh, point of view. I think he does a lot of things right that aren't necessarily... uh, You know, he's not getting the lick of the ice cream every time. But uh, in saying that, I do think he needs to kick one or two a game and take you know, seven or eight marks. Yeah. <laughs> and he's just not doing that at the moment. Um, I'm not putting the line through him, but I'm really excited to see if Ben Brown now gets another crack at it. He has to. He's had another f- five or six weeks under his belt with training. Um, I saw an interview during the week and Mark Williams, or maybe it was Alan Richardson, said, we haven't been playing games, but Ben Brown at training, his intensity, the way he's moving is so much better than what it was um, at the start of his games with the Ds just because of the way... Um, you know, he came in off an interrupted preseason. So I think it's an exciting opportunity for the Ds and for Sammy. I, I, I'm keen to see him um, go back, put together some form. And, you know, if it is Sam Wiedemann when it comes to finals, then this will be a bloke really primed with some good footy under his belt. And if it's Ben Brown when it comes to finals, once again. So I'm, I'm really excited about the situation we're in. I just think it's probably time Benny Brown gets another crack at it. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Uh, my goals, and uh, it's as bleedingly obvious as it gets, and we've already touched on it, but uh, if you're not giving a goal to Neil Danaher on uh, the <laughs> big freeze MND round, um, I just don't know what you will give a goal to. So uh, <laughs> let's hope and pray he gets at a, uh, Australian of the Year, but it, even if he doesn't, I don't think he needs a recognition. Everyone understands um, how amazing uh, it is what he's done. And uh, I just hope and pray that Dees win the flag and he is the one that presents a cup. That is still the fantasy of mine. That would be fairy tale type stuff. And that's a great goal by you, Rog. And I'll wrap up the show and wrap up, uh, wrap up the segment with my goal, which we touched on 
a little bit earlier in the show um, and we actually potted them a little bit. But I did think that West Coast's performance on the weekend, on the Sunday night, to pinch that game, get the game back on their terms and pinch it, I thought it was uh, a good scalp, um, even though it was eighth place at their home turf. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was really impressed for them to get the game back, especially after Martin kicked that one where he sort of skidded it along the ground. Um it looked like a sealer to me, but for the West Coast Eagles to get back in it and pinch the win, I just I was so excited by the footy on Sunday night over in the West, full crowd. It was a good spectacle. Um, so fair play to the West Coast Eagles for pinching the win on Sunday night. It was an absolutely magic round of footy, Doss. A couple of games decided by a kick. We have a champion bowing out the fight. MND, what more could you possibly ask for? Perfectly put, Rog. I think that'll be us for the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. You can go and munch some dinner now. What are you going to eat? Oh, I'm definitely not cooking something at this hour, so I think I'm <laughs> going to duck out. I might have to do myself a, a cheeky, a cheeky uh, long weekend treat that perhaps I, I, I'm not entitled to, but I'll have anyway. Maybe a, a Hungry Jacks or something of the sort. Oh, delicious. That'll go down an absolute treat. Rog, thanks for joining me. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And uh, we'll do this all again next week. Uh, Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Thanks to everyone who watched on the YouTube channel. And we'll see you next time for some more Back Pocket Plug Out podcastery. Keep plugging those back pockets.